So why don't we why don't we get the yeah. panel in here too? So what I'd like to do is invite all of our uh, panelists here to to enable their webcams. They should be able to come on, enable your microphones, and let's get the panel going because I think there's some of these questions that these uh, that our panelists have a lot of experience on too. There's some of these questions I think that are very specific to your uh, presentation, uh, but I think we also have a couple of good uh, questions here. So before we before we dive into the questions, you can see everybody. We've got a fantastic uh, panel lineup here today. Before we get started, I wanted to just let everybody take just a minute to introduce themselves, where they're working, what they're working on, and to get an idea, because again, this thing is all about, Bill speaks about performance, scale, the scalability. Obviously, you know that, um, you know, Israel and Yvonne, John, uh, you know, Zach, they're not, uh, we're not talking about people just working on uh, backyard garage projects. We're talking about people with a lot of experience working on uh, some major projects. So I think they've got some good perspective here. So okay, let's start with um, Zach, really. I'm just going to go from left to right on my screen. Zach, if you want to start, then John, Israel, then Yvonne. Talk a little bit about um, what you do, how many repos you're working in, and, and also the fun debate that always pops up. We can talk about later too a little bit versus sort of the mono repo versus multi repo. Um, there's a couple other questions I'd love to ask uh, you all, but let's get let's get started with that. So Zach, why don't we why don't we get you going? Hello. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? We can. Yep. Um, hi, I'm Zach Swears. I work at Slack uh, in our New York office. Um, prior to Slack, I was at uh, Uber and Flipboard. Um, so you might have seen me around from there. Um, some bit about our setup. Uh, we have really just one repo that, uh, one repo and only one app that we maintain. So it's a, it's a sort of simpler setup. Um, we have about 30 Android developers working in it, um, give or take. So, yeah. Great. John, far away. Hello, everyone. My name is John Rodriguez, and I work at Swear on the Cash App product, previously on the Point of Sale product, um, but doing um, Android things and uh, contributing in uh, a few of the Square open source repos as well. Um, a quick search in terminal tells me that Cash App has 261 Gradle modules, and we are uh, concernedly trying to modulize further. Um, point of sale, um, I believe, has reached in the, the thousands of modules, if not the high hundreds. Um, when I left, it was around like 400 modules. So um, that gives you kind of a, a scope of like the size of projects that uh, I've dabbled in. Um, I've uh, played around with like Gradle plugins as well, and I've given a couple of talks on the Android Gradle plugin. So uh, lots of good questions coming in. It's, you know, you, we, as people try to increase their speeds. Gotcha. Israel. Try to mute myself. Hey, hello everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Israel Ferrer Camacho, and I'm, I work at Dropbox in the mobile team, uh, doing Android mostly, uh, in the New York office too. And uh, we have a monorepo for all the platforms, uh, and we have over 300 modules there for Android, um, but the iOS uh, application is there too. Um, and yeah, we are using Gradle for Android and back for iOS. Great. Ivan? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Ivan Gavrilovic, and I'm uh, an engineer on the Android Gradle plugin. Um, our setup is, I think, when I checked around like 100 projects that we have that are related to the Android Gradle plugin and some other libraries that are used by the Android Studio. Um, Part of the build is in Gradle, and part of the build is actually in Bazel because uh, of the some internal requirements requirements that we had uh, when it comes to building the actual IDE. Um, yeah, that's about it. Okay, good. I, there were some. One of the reasons I wanted to get the panel involved is because we saw some of the questions coming in. I thought were really applicable to the panel. Um, if if there, you know, what we're going to click through some of these. Are there anything that you guys are seeing on here that you'd like to address? Um, uh, quickly before we uh, get into some other questions. I'm, I'm happy to kind of cherry pick some of these questions here. Anything that you see on, on here that, uh, that you guys want to answer collectively? Can I put Ivan on the spot for that original cap question bit, just since he's worked on it uh, quite a bit? 
Yeah, I think that one was uh, was interesting. So it was, I think, the first question that showed up on Slido. Uh, the question was, what is the impact of KPT on on build speed? So when you're using Dagger or Hilt, um, that, that's a good question. And before that, I think I need to explain just a tiny bit how KPT works. So um, whenever you're running KPT, basically there are two tasks that that matter in your build. The first one is the one that generates um, Java stubs from the Kotlin sources, and the other one actually runs annotation processing. So the first one is basically a lightweight coupling compilation. So the, the compiler front end runs, it resolves all the types, and then it just generates the, the, the Java stubs. So you can think of it like in terms of the duration, it is, it's like fairly comparable to actual coupling compilation, the one that's actually generating the, the full class files. Um, after that, uh, the KPT task is essentially just a wrapper around uh, Java annotation processing APIs. KPT is literally just invoking JDK compiler APIs and just passing all the processors and all the setup that you may have put in your build file and just invoking annotation uh, processing there. Now, um, when it comes to the build speed and the impact, so coupling uh, compilation supports incremental processing. So you know, when you're change, when you have a change in the project, the stub generation is pretty much it should be able to run incrementally. So, so from that point of view, it shouldn't be too long. Now, the, the one of the issues was that uh, before KPT was supporting incremental annotation processing, you would essentially rerun all of the annotation um, processors. You would and you would need to reprocess all of the sources, which in apps that had you know that have lots of sources it is actually quite costly. However, like if you're using annotation processors that do support incremental annotation processing, I think you should uh, you should not see a big impact there. And Dagger does support it, I think, from 2.18, if I remember correctly. I think it's been enabled by default. Um, so yeah, give it a go. I'd say definitely try it out and see what is the impact uh, on your build. Great. I had a couple, uh, I saw a couple of questions that I wanted to give just small uh, addendum to, uh, to Nelson's great feedback. Um, one was on obfuscation and R8. Um, we run that only on our CI builds. Um, it's important to run them. Um, um, and sometimes it, it has shown um, some inadvertent runtime crashes. Like for, for example, for uh, using JSON parsers like JSON or, or Mashi, maybe we've misconfigured something. Um, and also um, during Espresso tests, because currently the test APK, what's for, what's bundled into the test APK is unable to necessarily do the, the tree walk of references that would otherwise be comprised in your main APK. And there, there are ways to go around that. I believe Zach wrote a plugin that helps there and there are some other um, uh, ways to go about that, but it's really helpful to run the obfuscation. However, to the point behind the question is, it probably doesn't have to be in your local developer build because that's it's kind of an 80-20 thing. So if you can run that in CI and maybe have a couple of tests that cover the cases, like launching the app and making sure all the, the app initialization doesn't crash because R8 might have been a little too aggressive and you may need to tweak some rules. It might be a nice healthy strategy to getting your build times to an acceptable fast level while still not compromising your production app integrity. Um, a second thing there, uh, someone asked, how what's fast? And um, the, the answer given there made a lot of sense of like, well, it depends on your build. Um, one, one, I guess, general solution that I see helps a lot is we strive to make in our multi-module project as many, and we're all, we're talking from this perspective of Android developers here, as many modules don't that don't need Android types, parcelable, activity, intent, if you can push that away to like your top most nodes in your Gradle graph and like when you're compiling the activity, you don't necessarily have to um, have intent leaking in all of those modules. And intent is essentially a, 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 a specialized map. And so if you can pass around a map of data and eventually bundle that later on in the build in the module that has to speak to Android things, you get a lot of benefits from that. First of all, you could eliminate RoboElectric from a lot of your tests, which is still um, a big source of like test run uh, slowness. Um, you can remove just a lot of things from the class path because you don't need Android.jar. Um, you, you you just reap a lot of benefits at exponential scale. And so like I think from a 
a first pass, if you want to, see, we've noticed um, increasing or decreasing build times when we achieve by essentially we graph using GraphViz um, uh, and using colors what are our Android and pure JVM modules and basically look to advance the front, <laughs> pushing Android and Android further to the top. And as we do so, we do see notable impact on build times. Mm -hmm. Let's I, actually, John. That's a good segue because you know you're talking about build times. I'd kind of like to see what the panel's thoughts are on some of the kind of surprising build performance improvements that you guys have made in your apps. What uh, what have been some of the the things that you've done to increase build times? What's what's been surprising? Or what's worked? I have a recent one, um, but first of all, I will say if you don't measure, you don't know that it's happening and we were aggressively improving the execution time of the build and we were ignoring the configuration time. And then when we were checking configuration time, we realized that that could owe more than what we were saving on execution. I was like, okay, we should start uh, measuring configuration and execution and taking care of both. Um, and, and pretty much any plugin that you add to your build, it's a hassle, right? Uh, and then and, and we need to be really careful uh, and and be measuring those every single day. So, you know, ideally that that's an automated job in the CI and then we have some alerts and those alerts will let us know if there is a regression in the speed. And when you do that, when you have that baseline, it's way easier to decrease the build time and uh, stop impacting the team really quick, right? So we had this uh, one plugin I won't name names, but we had this one plugin that was adding a listener to each configuration of each two module. And that means the execution time and multiply M listeners per M configurations in each module. And that adds like 30 seconds to our configuration, just that one plugin. Um, so, you know, just a heads up. Be careful adding plugins and make sure that you do perform and before and after measurement to see how that impacts your build. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. I mean, we we have the SQL Delight and Wire plugin that we're using internally in our app, and we're constantly mindful of how changes may inadvertently affect build speeds. So measuring that either if you're using the Gradle build scan functionality or you know profiling the file and just catting it out to standard out and diffing it across builds. Like you can at least come up with some rudimentary heuristic um, to show like, hey, I added this plugin because you want to add plugins, right? You want to reuse open source code that you don't have to otherwise write yourself. But to Israel's point, uh, measure, measure, measure so that you can um, catch these things as early as possible. Uh, I can tell an interesting story that we ran into, uh, or rather we kind of still run into sometimes it's a bit of a whack-a-mole game where it's easy for an annotation processor to accidentally become not incremental if it so it, even if it declares itself as incremental if it doesn't uh, adhere to certain requirements for incremental processing like attaching a source element for every um, file that it generates then it will run non-incrementally and a common case that we've run into this with is with dagger where Dagger is sort of maybe a little bit too helpful in the sense that if you like annotate your your constructor with add inject, but then don't remember to add the Dagger compiler uh, to your actual annotation processing for that project. If you use that somewhere upstream and the Dagger compiler is running there, it will just see that it doesn't have a corresponding factory generated for it and it will generate it for you upstream, but now it's generating a file that has no source element in your current compilation set. And that's basically something that I think maybe like once every month or so, uh, we you know we have a steady flow of new modules coming in and this one always comes up as a accidental omission. Uh, and it's easy to happen because it's not like it like fails your build if you don't do it, but uh, yeah, that makes a big difference because uh, at the end of the day, it's like our monolithic app module that is now running not incrementally. And that's where like 90% of our code is still. And uh, fixing that takes an incremental build from like, you know, a minute, 20 seconds down to as low as like 30 
um, depending on what kind of files you're changing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like sounds like either failing faster or having a lint check there to warn people would be a great way to mitigate that. Yeah, the way that we've solved it basically now is uh, we have a uh, we call it just Slack plugin that is a plugin that sort of like helps manage all of our projects. And if you want to add Dagger to a project, we actually don't expose the like raw Dagger dependencies, and instead we have like a little DSL. So it's like Slack and then inside like features, Dagger enabled, um, and that will do all the appropriate wiring. And it's nice because it also handles like, you know, if you're in an Android project, if you're in a plain Java project versus Kotlin, things like that. Mm -hmm. Israel, did you have some comment on that one or? Uh, not about that one. I mean, that one is a really good way to handle <laughs> the problem by it's like, so I had a, I forgot to mention that configuration phase on the Gradle build is not cacheable as of now. It's coming, but not as of now. So that means that when you add a module, you're impacting every single test that you run on Gradle. So I meaning even if you clean, you may be impacting that. Um, so like, that's why configuration, you know, per, uh, measuring configuration is so important. So let's, uh, Azrael, I want to I wanna follow up on that. What, and, and everyone can answer this, what's the criteria that you guys set for introducing a new module in the app, or when do you split an existing module into multiple modules? Uh, I don't know if we have set criteria. Um, I mean, there are, I, I don't know if every module is the same. Like, you have new features that should probably begin in its new set of modules. But then you may also at the same time want to refactor bundles of logic that are in the main app module to be reused elsewhere. And those are at least two different strategies of how to modularize. I mean, maybe other people have some uh, good heuristics here. Uh, for us, yeah, I think that policy of like every new feature, the default expectation is that that should probably go in its own module. Um, we are in sort of, as I mentioned earlier, we're in this sort of classic case of we're trying to modularize, but we still have like 90% of the code in the like this to work app module. Um, and I don't know that there's as much of a like rule or criteria for moving things as much as like thunderous applause when someone does actually take the time to go move something out. Um, yeah, there will be some like, you know, what should go here, what should go there kind of discussion, but uh, in general, I think we've just tried to promote it whenever a good opportunity comes up and not really worry about like bike shedding, like the design of, you know, what goes in different modules. Yeah, that's fair. I think here we need to play a balance on allowing every feature team to create their own modules when they need it. But at the same time, we need to start thinking that for each module we create, there are a bunch of tasks that are created for those modules. So we need to make sure that we are not, like Bugsnack is gonna create uh, one task for each sub-module that you create, right? So like, we need to make sure that we are not creating like 500 new tasks per module, that there is not a lot of like over weight on creating a module because then everything in the configuration especially is gonna be more uh, expensive. So, you know, we did, we, we, we worked on measuring how much each module impacts our build because uh, because we are close to 500 and, mm -hmm. and we wanted to be sure that uh, that was not a problem. And I think we were creating like 70 tasks per module. And uh, we were able to, you know, by doing the dev mode or engineering mode that Nelson was recommending, we were able to disable some plugins that then it creates less tasks per module. It's, it's you know, at some point, um, yes, it's microseconds, but like microseconds per 400, it's less microseconds and they become more seconds, right? So, yeah. so you, you need to balance the scalability with uh, that, with the flexibility for development. Yeah. I think that the point about being mindful of the plugins that you add is really important. Um, if you use that dependency analysis plugin that uh, Nelson mentioned in his talk, it actually has some basic detection for certain types of like known slow plugins that you could uh, basically remove because it sees them as unused. Um, Capt is the sort of elephant in the room as usual with that. Um, Capt in general, if you can avoid it, just makes a huge difference. Like even if you're using API and implementation, 
um, if if you have some downstream dependency where the uh, you have it's coming through as an implementation dependency for something else, even if you change that, the class path still changes for capped and capped reruns all of its stuff again. So it's uh, yeah, it, it's worth doing like a one-time audit. I think using that um, analysis plugin just to see you know if nothing else, at least removing the unused ones. Um, it'll make a bunch of recommendations for other things you can do that are going to be more involved the first time you run it, but uh, it's I've, I found it to be really useful. I see a question here about why disable debug versus release. Does it make any difference? Um, I think the answer is more philosophical. Um, I don't. Um, what our team does is. Um, we disable debug because release would impact our customers. That's what they would actually see. Um, debug will have a lot of developer settings, which if something were to break, we are enabled to you know, fix it very quickly. Um, but if we ship something to production, the, the feedback loop of making that fix, propagating it through the Play Store and ensuring that it's QA'd is just a longer feedback loop. So we really want to avoid having release broken more more sensitively than if we just break ourselves and we send a PR um, to fix it. Uh, so again, it's about our philosophy on that. Um, I'm, maybe there's uh, other philosophies across the, the panel here. Um, the What we do at Slack that I'm pretty happy with is just all of our libraries are set to be single variant. So the only thing that actually has different flavors is the actual app module. Uh, which again, 90% of the code is there anyway, so we're not getting as much of a benefit as we'd like, but at least in terms of like configuration setup, um, yeah, every library is just set to release. Um, we had a couple of libraries that were relying on being able to have like debug and release variants, but you can also just split those up into uh, three smaller artifacts with like an API a release version and a debug version. We do this for like Flipper, for instance, uh, which is like a debugging tool where in the production app, we provide a no op version of it, and in debug builds, we um, have the actual implementation of it. And those are easy to control with you know, debug implementation versus release implementation. Thank you. Uh, I think, yeah, uh, I think uh, go ahead, Nelson. Uh, I just want to add when, when looking at these flavors, it's just important to be mindful of where you put them and how you're using it. Uh, there's a lot of apps where you know, the structure of your code, if, if you need the flavor just to change, you know, the app icon for a different market, then it might make sense to just have a, a build flag that'll change the icon instead of recompiling your code twice to, to have a different flavor. Um, so it's just important to be mindful of the tools you're using because if you add a build flavor, that's all your code is twice, all your, like everything is, is multiplied. So just make sure that it, yeah, the tool you're using is is what what you want to happen. And of course, in really small projects, it doesn't matter that much to have all these build flavors. But as you start to scale up, you know, to Slack or Square, or Dropbox size, like then it starts to matter. I saw a question that uh, I don't know where it went, but it was about KT Lin formatting, um, and I think a few of us were actually interested in uh, touching on that one. Charlie, um, go ahead. Yeah, the, uh, so the question was around like KT Lint format from the KT Lint Gradle plugin. It takes a long time because it has to run configuration for everything. Um, and I was gonna say that uh, our solution for that is that we just don't use it. Um, and by, or rather, we use it for checks on CI, but for actual formatting, we just set up a commit hook and check in the KT Lint uh, jar directly, and it just runs that during the commit hook. So you don't have to pay the cost of doing Gradle configuration every time. We started with Gradle configuration, and then people were like, hey, why are my Git commits taking two minutes? I don't, I don't understand. And uh, that's, that's worked pretty well for us. We do sort of the same with the text, not for formatting, but just running a subset of detect checks on every commit hook, like the most common and uh, quickest ones. And so I, I don't have numbers to back this up, but before one of the CI checks that people get hit by most often was like, you know, KT lint format failed or detect failed. And now those are 
almost never failing checks that people run into anymore? Yeah, I think any static analysis tool that you want to run, you don't really want to run it while compiling. So like move it at the last point in the chain when do it, when you really need it. So like you need it for the code review, you need it to merge it in master rate. So like, as Zach said, we move it to the uh, Git commit uh, book, yeah, the same. Uh, I think here, uh, I just want to second what Zach said. Basically, we have a setup in which we are not specifically using KDLint, but we're using Google Java Formatter. Um, which I find it's like super great because it gives you deterministic output always. And it's great to have that kind of formatting tool. Um, and basically what we do is uh, it, it's an upload hook. We are using the repo, uh, it's an AOSP tool for managing multiple Git repositories. But basically we, whenever you want to push something, some CL, we run these, uh, these checks. And just to add one thing when it comes to st uh, static code analysis, I think like one thing that is sometimes like missed in the discussion is also, just relying on the IDE and lint in the IDE to to do the right thing, uh, I think like it's, it's super helpful that like while you're working on the code, just you can fix it straight away. Uh, so it's not necessary that you have to run this, you know, from scratch kind of thing. You can just rely on the IDE, you know, mm -hmm. uh, providing you with suggestions as you as you uh, write code. Yeah, we to on that note, this is a bit of a touchy topic, but like Android Lint, for example, hasn't we've written custom lint checks. Um and they they constantly uh need maintaining when a new version of the Android Gradle plugin comes out and, and sometimes like breaks our CI. Like right now our 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 lowest our slowest running shards on CI, including the Espresso test shard, is the are the lint shards. Um and we're actually considering disabling it on CI, which we don't want to do for obvious reasons. Like then we're kind of flying blind on some things, but um, we would, I know like we've, there's been mention of this in some of the Google groups where it would be really nice maybe to get some um, roadmap there to hopefully make that a little more extensible. <laughs> Feedback noted. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, checks. So about, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was gonna say, lint, lint checks. The the more that you can reduce, we'll say, developer cycles of like going to CI and then lint failing and then them coming back to fix it and then going back again, uh, the better. Just because, uh, yeah, it's sort of by design. Lint gets a little bit slower every update. Um, with AGP four, it got a lot slower. We're still trying to figure out why. So uh, it's really powerful for yeah, you're never going to find a more uh, apt spot to inform people about lint issues than in their IDE and where their code is. Yep. So leaning on that um, has been it's been nice for us at least. And talking about uh, under lint on the IDE, I encountered that that makes uh, especially cold in files a little bit slower to read uh, because seen i think you know, there is some issues i actually reported but like uh that's why uh, i have the, them disabled on the id and i rely on the on the, i don't know if all, i don't know if all those are lint or some of those might be intellij inspections but uh whenever i'm waiting for the i in the upper right of my id <laughs> to hover and i see slow inspections doing that slow counter um i just get a coffee <laughs> i i have a, i have those disabled too I just, uh, I, it's pretty much been for me now at this point. Uh, There's some known issues <laughs> in the Kotlin plugin itself, um, like the IntelliJ plugin that uh, they're, they exist on Utrack. You can follow along with them there. Um, yeah, I think my favorite one right now is uh, optimizing imports will take like 15 yep. seconds on like a trivial file, which is uh, <laughs> sort of alarming. But anyways, we should we should get back to the questions. Um, yeah, there was kind of a follow, there was a follow up there from somebody. I'm just going to read it here. When modularizing, how strict are you when deciding and forcing whether or not a module has an Android plugin enabled library app or whether it should be Kotlin only? Actually, this is a direct follow up, but it it, uh, it was just just came in. And I thought it would kind of keep that discussion mm -hmm. going. Sure. Um, um, uh, please. Uh, I was going to say, we don't have like a set policy on it. I would say that probably the default right now 
for like historical reasons is to just make it an Android project. Um, J Rod mentioned this earlier. They're like, if you can just make it a plain old Java or plain old Kotlin project, then it is going to be faster by virtue of having less overhead. Um, mm -hmm. So that's something that we want to try to explore doing with the help of the dependency analysis plugin in the future. Um, basically detecting like, could this project be a plain uh, you know, JVM project and if it's not using anything from, from Android. But um, a, a member of our team, Benoit, just wrote a blog post on this. Um, uh, it describes our architecture and it's, it's opinionated. Everyone has their own architecture. Um, but ours uh, tends to be where we have some concept of a presenter controller that is Android uh, unaware. It is a completely JVM. And so the idea is that that presenter contains all of your business logic um, and whether it's rendering that to an ASCII terminal, an iOS platform because you're using Kotlin multi-platform or an Android device, it is unaware. And then that can be a JVM Kotlin module. Um, and then you would probably have an analogous views module. We, we are single activity. That's another opinionated uh, architecture that we use. And because we're single activity, um, all our activities are really in that kind of app hairball module. And then we'll delegate all our feature specific views, you know, the, the cash card views, the boost views, those will all be in a views Android library module. And so that makes sense, right? You need context, you need resources, you need uh, fonts, et cetera. So that would all live there. And then, so then the boundary conditions there are going to be like, how do you represent uh, something that is font-like or image-like. Well, so we create, you use Kotlin seal classes and like an icon class. And like if we have, uh, let's say the icon has three different modes, we'll have three different values in that seal class. And we propagate that from the presenter to the view. Internally to the view, the view will then map that to say a Picasso, you know, image renderer or, you know, what have you. So that's keeping the Android boundaries only within the view and then just creating some lightweight mapping layer will allow you to kind of push more now of the Android platform out of your build modules. So, this, so that's how you achieve that goal or one way gotcha. to achieve it. Excellent. We, we spent a lot of time earlier um, in the discussion talking a little bit about, a lot about plugins, in fact, or features plugins. And I think this is something that maybe uh, Yvonne and, and Nelson could maybe talk a little bit about it's I know it's a little bit departure from what we were just talking about but um, talking about what are some of the kind of the issues that your teams uh, Google and Gradle are seeing uh, with sort of community plugins and, and projects today um, love to kind of get your your take on that yeah um, it's a good one I mean I'd say that when talking about the plugins that you apply to your build, I, I, I'd like to see more people thinking about them in the same way that you're thinking when you're adding a library to your application, right? Like you would do some sort of audit there, figure out, you know, what's the quality, does it does what it says it does, and, and just apply some level of scrutiny there, like when actually adding something to your build that may impact the, the, the build performance ultimately. So, and I think that's that's on the on the folks, you know, that's I would say that's responsibility of the folks who are maintaining the building their companies, or like if there's none, I guess all the engineers. Um, so some of the issues that we are seeing is um, I'd say like on the AGP side, we were not as good when it comes to talking about our APIs and how people should use those APIs, and that has led to lots of confusion, people sort of scrambling just to do their thing. Um, and that is something that we're trying to address in 4.1. Actually, there's like a subset of the new APIs that we're working on and 4.2 should have the finished version of those APIs, allowing plugin authors to, to customize their Android part of the build in, in a reliable way and in a way that does not impact the build. Um, I'd say that's like on our side, but I, I also say that I think the documentation on the Gradle side, while it's pretty good for some things, I'd say like to, to when it comes to plugin authors, I think it could be more opinionated and more like tutorial based and just like to tell people how exactly to do things. And to be fair, like things have been changing quite a lot recently. And I think there's lots of improvements there. Like the one that comes to mind uh, immediately, it, like we are running all of our builds. There's like a flag dash dash warning mode. And like we are running all of, all of our tests with dash dash warning mode equals fail. 
What this means is basically Gradle runs some checks uh, dynamically, and then if it detects that you're doing something that you shouldn't, it's just going to break, right? And that's how we we catch lots of issues on our end. I mean, we we also you know introduce bugs. Um, so you know, it, I think that that um, that helps a lot. And also, I'd say for the plugin authors, just like keeping up to date with all of the new stuff, it, it can be a bit overwhelming. But I think, for instance, when it comes to configuration caching, the new stuff that it should be like in Sigma 6 of Gradle. I think that's really worth the investment. And I think for the plugin authors, I, I think it's for, for the older users of their plugins, it's going to be a huge benefit if all of the plugins are actually compatible with configuration caching because it's going to impact build like positively quite a lot. You're yeah, saying we so shouldn't use the internal packages that we see? <laughs> oh, dot dot internal, like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those are really good points. I just wanted to add a little bit to that. I think as a plugin author, it's definitely really difficult to keep up with all the new API changes that are happening, um, like lazy or task configuration avoidance, like property providers, configuration caching, like all these things. And um, a lot of times plugins want to maintain some backward compatibility to be compatible with larger projects. So it, um, it sometimes is a difficult choice for um, plugin maintainers, like do they want to just do nothing and support larger projects or um, update to the new APIs and use the performance uh, of those APIs. Um, one, one of the things my team actually does right now at Gradle is when we see one of these issues with some of our larger customers, we actually try and fix it in the open source library. So Daz, for example, on my team worked on the Spotless plugin, actually is currently working on the Spotless plugin to make it incremental. Um, some of the like some of the, the things is, you know, if you're just working on a plugin, you're probably using it on your small project, but sometimes people take this small plugin and apply it to like a massive project and then it has scaling problems and that's we just have to work and fix those scaling problems. Um, yeah, so task configuration avoidance is one. Another one my team sees is, uh, this is more for larger projects too, but uh, remote cache misses. So when uh, some task input to your task is not compatible with your remote build cache, one example is using absolute paths as an input. Um, and this is something that I think it's really hard to test for, and most Gradle plugin authors are completely blind to because, well, you're only testing it on your local machine. Uh, so that's another one that my team helps out with. Uh, and we also have one for the Android Gradle plugin. Another one um, I just want to note is please file bugs <laughs> for all these things, whether it's a plugin, you know, you see performance issue with it. Doesn't matter if it's with Gradle, if it's with the plugin, with Android Gradle plugin, like the feedback is really valuable uh, to use to improve, like how many people are having that issue um, and things like that. So one question that I often get from people when I give similar feedback is how do I, if I can't come up with a sample repro or if I can't determine whether it's Gradle, Kotlin or AGP's fault, how do I do that? Do you have any maybe advice on that? Um, because it, that could probably be part of the barrier to getting those issues filed is now you, you know, um, you file on all the issue trackers and the authors are like, oh, this is an hour problem. It's this problem. It can be a little hard to um, be motivated to do that. Yeah, that's a really hard one. That's why yeah, I have the slides <laughs> at the beginning. Where it's like, all right, there's JetBrains, there's Google, there's Gradle. Um, yeah. Honestly, it's it. I I don't think I have a good answer for that. I'm not going to try and bullshit anything. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think what, uh, what we did recently was uh, we found an issue on a plugin, and uh, we just got like two build scans, one with and one without uh, the plugin, and then we did. A little bit, you know, we read the code and see, well, I think this is the problem. And then we remove the line, and it was obvious that was the problem. But I guess at that point, you are just submitting the fix. I know. But uh, I, I, I guess uh, we want to know 
as owners of an application if the plugin is the problem or not because the if the reason that we have the plugin is because it gives us some features right so i think that's something we need we have to deal but like a, a ab performance measurement should you know enable and disable the plugin should be obvious if it's like a big issue right so yeah no i think with uh just to, to add something here like i'd say like definitely please do file bugs like i'd say it's even better to file bug in the wrong for the, the wrong company at the wrong yeah. wrong component rather than just staying quiet right i mean what i try to do and what my team tries to do is like we, we see some report uh, a bug report and then then we will try to figure out whether it's you know issue in, in the maybe ide whether it's in the Kotlin compiler whether it's Gradle or some other third party plugin but at the same time i'd say please try to you know add some data to it like just uh, describing this doesn't work full stop and, and creating a bug is, is good but like it's you know we're <laughs> not that many action items on our end so just try to add some data and then the, the, someone will hopefully help you to in, direct you to you know to the right issue tracker if, if you got if you got it wrong yeah the the thing i was going to say uh, related to that is basically it's better to file with like limited data than to not have it filed anywhere at all especially because once you have it filed somewhere if someone else runs into the same issue they can then chime in on it with perhaps more uh, context on it that makes it easier to sort of start seeing what the similarities are mm -hmm. um, and also just make sure that you're making it knowing that you can like help them test stuff so you know if i'm like hey like i don't i don't really know how to like put this into a reproducible sample it only happens in our giant monolithic app um but if there's anything i can try let me know um and that back and forth is usually really helpful and i think not always you would think that it's like like implied um or implicit but i think that it's important to also just drop it in there as an option mm -hmm. Um, should but we try to burn down some of these questions? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I think that's a good idea. Yeah, you know, I would suggest say we, we uh, depending, I don't know how much time you guys have uh, to, to stay with us, because we can keep these questions archived and uh, send those on to Nelson. Uh, we've got a we've got a handful of these, but I think we are pushing up a little bit against our time limit here uh, for the panel. Um, so maybe, maybe Nelson, if you're okay, what we'll do is archive these questions and, and push those out to you to get back to some people on. Yeah, I guess I'll follow up with you on how to get the answers yep. to the right people. Okay, yeah, we'll do that. We'll kind of figure out a way to post those. Um, <laughs> I did want to just kind of um, ask one, one kind of final question on our, on our way out here. want to look sort of forward here and, and talk a little bit about some of the features um, some of the changes that uh, build maintainers should be prepared for uh, in the future. What's kind of some of the things that are, it might be a little bit for Nelson and I haven't, but I uh, want to talk a little bit about looking forward here, what uh, what people can expect in terms yeah. of the feature. I, I think the biggest one I can see is for sure configuration caching in Gradle. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to impact everything from your build scripts to plugins you use, um, you know, Gradle version, Android Gradle, like everything is going to change in order to support this feature. It's really a big, a big effort, and it's a big collaboration too between the Gradle teams, the the Google team, and the the JetBrain team. Uh, but it's gonna it's gonna make for a, a lot faster build. So that would be the thing to watch out for. I would say. Yeah, I would just add the, the thing that, that I think I already mentioned. It's the new APIs that uh, that we're working on uh, in, in, on the Android Gradle plugin. So uh, while we're not going to remove the old ones, we're you know we're going to start deprecating them, and we're going to provide um, migration tutorials for folks to start uh, using the the new ones. Right. Another thing that I drop in, uh, and Elon, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Namespace resources should be available in AGP 4.1, um, I think. And that one basically would uh, be a pretty big win for avoiding that merge resources task, especially if you have you know, the giant app module at the top. 
that's usually one of our longer ones. Yep, yep, yep. I, I think we have addressed uh, part of that. Yeah, for the one, I think it should be there. Great. Hey, Pell, thank you so much for everyone for being here. Nelson, excellent job on the presentation. A lot of good takeaways there. We did have a lot of questions. I'm, I'm apologize to some of our uh, attendees who we weren't able to get these questions to, but we, we do have an archive in Slido uh, and we'll make sure uh, to work with Nelson on making sure we get some questions that were specific to his presentation answered and out to everyone who attended uh, the session.